Thank you to our praise choir for uh, elevating our worship sound this morning. Really appreciate that as well for everybody that put the time in for that. We greatly appreciate you uh, being here on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday to remember our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say a special thank you to our guests that are here today. Those of you who are not weekly attenders at Kirby Wood. So we are so excited for you to be here with us today. Uh, of, of all places you could have been, you are here with us at Kirby Woods, and I just want to say thanks for being here. Today you will hear a message that I've entitled, My Redeemer Lives, which is a nod to the Old Testament book of Job 19.25. Some questions for us as we begin today. What is a redeemer? Do you need a redeemer? Uh, what does it mean to be redeemed? How should life be different? for redeemed people. The word redeem has a lot of connotations. So maybe we should begin by going through some of them over history. Older definitions of the word can mean uh, that someone's freedom was bought. Perhaps someone in a, a great amount of debt or even perhaps a slave was bought uh, and, and freed. We even hear stories of, of slaves buying their own freedom sometimes in history, redeeming themselves. Uh, the English word traces its root to the Latin, which literally means to buy back something. Uh, some definitions include the payment of a ransom. Modern definitions can mean the, the turning in of one item in exchange for another. Uh, how many of you are extreme couponers? Anybody? A few of you? Okay, don't be afraid. Yeah, I, we, we don't like you when you hold up the line, but we understand the grind, okay? Um, that's redeeming something. Uh, maybe you, years ago, um, maybe you were a Gen Xers or, or millennials remember the arcade when you would go spend $40 on tickets to buy a $5 laser pointer and think it was the coolest thing in the world. Maybe it could mean that you fixed a mistake, something that you did was wrong and then you tried to go back and undo it. And perhaps even if you succeeded, someone would say you totally Redeemed yourself, perhaps. When you need redemption, it, it means you understand you're in a difficult situation. You need a way out of the situation that you're in. If things keep going the way they're going, you'll be in deeper trouble, in a darker place. But a redeemer gives you the chance of freedom to get out of the pit. Over the last couple of decades, there's been a uh, a subgenre of movie that has gained a lot of popularity in the action genre called revenge movies. I know mostly only men like those movies, but the most popular one, this is just me guessing, is probably Liam Neeson's Taken. They've recreated that thing so many times, it's over, stop. Um, but the, the formula of these kind of movies, uh, someone is wronged early in the movie, uh, he, then they go on a mission to set right what was wrong, or, or someone is harmed, someone is captured, and a hero sets out on a quest to make things right. This occurs as uh, the arc of movies that aren't even revenge movies. So uh, most of you probably saw uh, the Infinity Wars, the Endgame saga, a grand arc to stop Thanos from erasing half the population, or for the nerds like myself, the journey of Frodo and Sam to take the ring of power and destroy it before Sauron can take Middle-earth captive. From comic books to epic tales to gritty action movies, the concept of a redeemer is everywhere for a reason. It's written into our culture because it's written into our hearts. And it's often part of the stories we tell because it is the source of the greatest story ever told. And I don't mean fiction. We are here today to celebrate the great Redeemer who died for us, who rose and lives evermore. The mission of Jesus began in a manger stall in Bethlehem, culminated in an empty tomb, and that tells you everything about his mission that you should know and what he came to defeat. Because our great enemy is death, our redemption required a resurrection. My hope for everyone here today is that you would recognize the condition of death that confuses and plagues this world and long for something better, a way out. And ultimately, my hope is that you declare your faith in the Redeemer. 
As long as the Redeemer lives, there is hope. Our Redeemer is not dead, but he has risen. Let's begin with a word of prayer, if you would pray with me. Father, we come to you with open hands, open hearts, and open minds, that you would use this moment for your glory. God, this is a joyous day. Help us to receive the truth that you have laid out for us today. God, I pray that someone's heart would be moved from death to life, just as you were. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I want to show you what I'm going to call in the course of this outline, the road to redemption. I want to take us on a path to that ultimate victory, that glorious redemption in the end that we sang about just now in many ways. But I want to make sure to honestly show you the path that it took to get there. Because the road to redemption is not a rainbow road with sunshine and giggles. It was not for Jesus. It wasn't for his followers but it does end in glory. So I give you four stops on the road to redemption today. I also, as I, I, I teach on the resurrection of Jesus, want to offer you a parallel story in the Old Testament of the Bible who lived not just 2,000 years ago, but 2,000 years before Jesus. His name was Job. And the disciples of Jesus ended up having a lot in common with Job. And I want to show you how today. The time of pain and confusion and darkness of when Job lost everything and regained everything is not unlike the time of pain and confusion and darkness of when the disciples of Jesus lost everything but ultimately regained everything. So let's begin by looking to Mark 15:42 if you want to turn there in your Bibles. We're going to read what happens after Jesus has died, after it's finished has been shouted after the soldier has plunged a spear into the side of Jesus to verify his death. Mark 15, 42, second book of the New Testament. The words will also be on the screen in case you prefer to look up and look there. Mark 15, 42 says this, when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. As we look at four stops today along the road to redemption, we'll see number one, it begins with the recognition of death. The recognition of death. Now, it's Easter Sunday, and I don't want to linger here too long, but we have to acknowledge what it was like in the time after the cross on Friday, but before Sunday morning. And guys, it was pretty dark because Jesus was crucified on a Friday. That means the next day was Saturday, uh, the Sabbath, and uh, the incentive was to get him off the cross before sunset. That's why the others to the cross on the left and the right had their legs broken because they wanted to hurry this thing up. A wealthy man named Joseph, a secret follower, not secret for long after this, uh, who was on the Sanhedrin, made a request to Pontius Pilate for the body to go into his tomb. Now, often poorer victims of crucifixion were just thrown into mass graves in these days, covered with dirt, and moved on. But Joseph did not want Jesus to experience that. We are thankful for that. And so he offers his rock tomb, usually for the wealthy. Verse 45 if you look at it, really hit me when I read it this week. There's a word in there that's only used in Mark's gospel. Maybe you notice what that word is. It says, Pilate granted the corpse to Joseph. Now, I checked different Greek words often used for the body of Jesus. This is different, this word. That word corpse just stuck with me. After all the excitement was over. When Jesus died, the people dissipated. It was just soldiers and a few women. Mary was there. Perhaps John was there. I imagine it was very quiet. 
You could hear the sound of nails being pulled from a wooden crossbar. You know that sound when you're pulling a nail with the back of a hammer out of wood? I'd imagine you could hear every sound. The sound of soldiers giving orders to one another, very matter-of-factly, very business-like. You get his left arm, okay, you get the feet. All right, lay him down. The sound of dead weight hitting the ground when they laid his body on Golgotha's hill. And then someone picked up what Mark called the corpse. To think that Jesus, even for just three days, was a corpse. It's hard to hear. The Son of God left the glories of heaven above to become a corpse for us with holes in his hands and his feet and his side, lashes on his back, punctures on his brow from a crown of thorns. Mary probably held the corpse and looked down at Jesus and had memories of Bethlehem 33 years ago. This was what he was born to do, but it didn't make it easy. He who made the world and everything in it was reduced to what Mark 15, 45 simply calls the corpse. And on this day in Jerusalem, it seemed to everybody that death had won. In the book of Job, we see a man who was godly and righteous, not sinless like Jesus, but righteous. Job loved the Lord. He, he led his family to honor God. He was a wealthy man who had everything an ancient wealthy man could have. But Satan set out to destroy Job. And in just a short amount of time, Job, uh, Job's children were attacked by enemy raiders and killed. All of his livestock were killed. All of his camels were killed. Then Job's body was attacked with sickness and sores covered his body. And he is left scraping himself in a pile of ashes with broken pottery. Even Job's wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Job did not listen to that advice, but it doesn't mean he did not struggle. In Job 14, 7 to 12, Job writes, sitting in the ashes from these words, he says, there's, there's hope for a tree if it be cut down, that it will sprout again and that its shoots will not cease. Though its roots grow old in the earth and its stump dies in the soil, yet at the scent of water, it will bud and put out branches like a young plant. But a man dies and is laid low. Man breathes his last, and where is he? As waters fail from a lake and rivers waste away and dry up, so a man lies down and rises not again. Till the heavens are no more, he will not awake or be roused out of his sleep. Job, in his darkest moment, is saying what many people say. Death is the end. Job ponders, even, even trees that you cut down come back to life sometimes. But if a man is cut down, it's over. There's no life after death, Job says, for the moment. I wonder what the disciples of Jesus thought about on Friday night. You ever think about what they put their head on the pillow and thought about Friday and Saturday? That corpse was taken. It was wrapped in spices and laid in Joseph's tomb. The reality was that death had taken hold. The serpent had struck the heel. And they had to recognize along with Job that they had been afflicted by death's sting. There was a recognition of death. That's number one. Secondly, we see a fog of confusion. The fog of confusion. Now, you might mistakenly think that Peter, Andrew, James, John, Thaddeus, Thomas, Nathaniel, all the boys that, oh, I bet they were just sitting outside the tomb with popcorn in their hand, waiting on Jesus to walk out alive. You might assume they had faith at first without sight. Well, let me show you an example from Luke 24 and 19 to get in the mind of those in the days following Jesus' death. On that Sunday, there were two followers of Jesus walking together, debating and chatting, and they're recapping the events of the weekend. A third man, hint, hint, approaches them and asks, what you talking about? Look at the verses, uh, Luke 24, 19. He said, what things? What you talking about? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. How our priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Now listen to this. But we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. 
Yes, and besides this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. So they understood rightly Jesus was a prophet, a great teacher, a miracle worker. They rightly understood he was crucified. But look at those words in verse 21. We had hoped he was the one to redeem. We had hoped. What darkened their hopes that they had? Three days of death. Everything those disciples had hoped and dreamed and desired hung in the balance on those days of death. They began to question everything that they had thought they understood. On the road to redemption in Christ, there are going to be moments of confusion for things that don't pan out the way that you expected. Something is going to happen in your life when you say, but God, why did it happen this way? The followers of Jesus were sitting in that fog of confusion. Even though I can show you chapter and verse, we can turn just a few pages to the left, and I can show you chapter and verse where he said, I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to rise. They didn't hear it. That didn't change their expectations and whatever they believed about Jesus before the cross, all the grand things they believed about Jesus before the cross, seeing that dead body go into the tomb wrapped up with spices was something that they were not prepared to see. It launched them into a deep confusion about what was up and what was down. When we think about Job, initially after his children died and his animals died, he stood firm on his faith initially. Job 1.21 says, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He had a clear mind up front. But then his wife told him to curse God. And then his three best friends show up, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, to begin systematically telling him, all these things happening to you are your fault because sin's in your life. They must be. And of course, that's not even true which is what makes Job actually a very difficult book to read because there's good advice and bad advice. But we see Job beginning to entertain these sour words. It starts to get in his head a little bit. Job 8, 29, he says this, I become afraid of my suffering, for I know, God, you will not hold me innocent. I shall be condemned. Why then do I labor in vain? I wash myself, I cleanse my hands with lye, yet you plunge me into a pit. My own clothes will abhor me. For he, God, is not a man as I am that I might answer him, that we should come to trial together. There's no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. Job is dealing with the confusion of death. He's dealing with the fact that even if his own sin had caused the trouble in his life, what could avail to wash it away? What could he do to cleanse himself even if it was his fault? Who could he talk to, to go talk to God? Job lived before the tabernacle. Job lived before the priests, before the Levites. He looks to God and says, there's not even an arbiter. That means like an umpire, a referee. There's a middleman, a counselor. There's not even a person in between us who could could mediate the problem that we've got going on. There's no middleman. He says, God's not a man that, that I can answer him. Who can go to trial with God? Maybe you've been here today and you've been in a moment of suffering, a moment of confusion, and you've had those exact thoughts in one way or another. Different words, but same thoughts. Maybe your thoughts were like the two men walking on the road. Maybe you had faith in God when you were a child. Maybe as a teenager, uh, then you grew up and something happened and you're not sure anymore. You hoped he was the one, but circumstances shook you. Or maybe you're like Job in that dark confusion that you you had friends that got in your ear, friends, real good friends who got in your ear and gave you bad advice and turned you away from the Lord. Or maybe God feels so far away that you're like, there's no arbiter that even talk to God. Hey, he's so far away. How do I even know who he is? Or if he hears, you're sitting here thinking, am I supposed to go to trial with God? If I got a problem, who do I even take it to? Can't go over God's head. I want you to know those are great questions. If you're here today and those are your questions, those are great questions. You are not alone, and I will tell you that you are not the first person, Christian or not, to struggle with these things. Job trusted the Lord, but he was in a fog of confusion. When it comes to living in a fog like that, and you've been there, 
When it comes to living in a fog like that, the question that you need to ask, and the question if you're out on a boat and you roll into some fog, the question if you're out on a plane in a helicopter, wherever, and you roll into some fog, it's all the same question. The question that you first need to ask is, how do I get out of here? Do I want to get out of here? Do I want to live in the fog? Or do I want out? Do I want to be redeemed out of this, out of this confusion? On this road to redemption, I'm going to just tell you, many people get there, they get to that spot, and they're in the fog, and they look around and say, this is terrible. I don't want to be here anymore. And then they say, you know what? I'm not going to step out of this. I want to live right here. Guys, that's foolishness. Don't stop in the fog. Don't stop in the darkness. There's more. And the story continues, and it gets better. We've seen the recognition of death. We've seen the fog of confusion. The way out is number three, the declaration of faith. The declaration of faith. I'm going to invite you to turn. I would actually really like you to look at this in your Bibles. Job 19, 23. Star it, highlight it. Job 19, 23. We're going to look at our character, Job, again. We see in chapter 19, because he's been in some dark stuff. We see in chapter 19, a clarity hit Job like a ton of bricks. And that's how life is sometimes. You know, you're, sometimes in life, you're not always thinking clear every day. There's peaks and valleys. There's moments when you're in the truth, and there's moments when you're entertaining lies, right? Job here has a moment where the clouds part and the sun shines on his mind. Look at what he says in 1923. He says, oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. Now, what he's about to say must be pretty good. If anybody says, hey, write this down, you're either listening to George Strait or what they're about to say is very, very important. Write it in the rock. What does he say? For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold not another. My heart faints within me. This man who has lost everything, his family, his possessions, his health, who's been beaten up by his friends, interrogating him, giving him poor counsel, suddenly says, somebody get a pen. Write this down. It's going to be good. Engrave it. I know my Redeemer lives. And he's going to stand on this earth. And after my body is destroyed, I'm going to get a new one and see God. And and you read that and you say, Pastor, how could Job, who lived 2,000 years before Jesus, suddenly understand what's going on here? Do you really think he knew what he was saying? And I would say this. The Holy Spirit of God gave Job a moment of clarity to see through the darkness. And I I think Job, in the middle of his pain and sorrow, could see a little stream of light, like it's through one of those slats in in the old barn, just a little streak of light coming through, and he made a decision that you need to make to trust that small stream of light that he could see more than to dwell in the fog that he could not see. He believed that somehow all this was going to be made right, even if he had to die first to see it. He trusted God would find a way to redeem him. Did he ever know the end of the story? No. But he knew somehow God was going to work it out. Somehow a redeemer would come and make things right. Even when he didn't fully see, that's called a declaration of faith. Things may look bad, but I know my Redeemer lives. Let's see how the story ends. What Job never saw. You know, you get to read in your Bible every day what Job wished he saw. Mark 16, 2. Turn there. Mark 16, 2. We read the fulfillment of what Job saw dimly through a prophetic lens, what he had faith in that became a reality. The body of Jesus placed inside the tomb on Friday before sunset. That's day one. All of Saturday passed by, the Sabbath, that's day two. Then Sunday morning at sunrise, day three, the story picks up outside of Joseph's tomb as the women arrive. Mark 16, two says this, very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went 
to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And they, he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Friends, I want you to know on that Sunday morning sunrise, there was no more talking about a corpse. An angel of God showed up and scared the Roman guard to death and they left. And then the angel rolled the stone away at the same time inside the tomb. The dead body of Jesus did something that had not been done before and it fundamentally changed human history, fundamentally changed your life and my life. The Spirit of God hovered in that tomb. The power of God surged in that body. And I believe every angel of heaven was holding their breath, sitting on 10,000 holy, holy, holies, ready to shout. I believe Satan and the demons of hell looked on with a little snarky grin on their face, thinking that they had won. But the serpent's head had a heavenly bounty, and it was crushing time. The dead, lifeless body, wrapped in cloths and wrapped in spices, began to breathe. The heart began to beat. A remade, resurrected body began to move inside those grave clothes, and Jesus walked out of the tomb alive, never to die again. Our Redeemer lives. And friends, this changed everything. The great enemy of mankind was defeated when Jesus walked out of the tomb alive. I want you to know that since the moment that Adam and Eve ate that fruit in the garden on that fateful day when God cursed humanity for sin in Genesis 3:19, when he said, you are dust and to dust you shall return. When those words were uttered from that day forward, death reigned. But I want you to know what Jesus did. He walked in and took out the big boy so everybody knew who was in charge. Remember when all of Israel sat there and quivered at Goliath standing, mocking them every day? King Saul wouldn't go defeat Goliath. Nobody could handle that man. He was the undefeated foe that nobody could kill. He let everybody know it. And this went on and on and on until one day David walked up with a sling and a stone and said, watch this. <laughs> Boom. Hit the ground. The giant fell. That's what Jesus did to death itself. He showed that he holds the keys. He said, watch this. And he went through an agonizing, brutal crucifixion. And even worse, he took the wrath of God for your sin and my sin. And he buried and carried my sins far away. But when he rose from the dead, he sent a message to everybody that death is not the end. It's not over till God says it's over. And because my Redeemer lives, because Jesus went first as the firstborn of all creation, we know one day he will live again when he raises us up too. And that's why Jesus had to rise from the dead. Maybe you're thinking, why did he have to do that? He had to take out the greatest enemy by defeating death directly. Jesus rising from the dead was to show you if he can do it for himself, he can do it for you too. If you believe, you have to, like... Like Job, overlook the suffering and the pain and the trials and look forward and say, even though I'm going to die, I know one day I will live again. I choose to believe by faith that Jesus did uh, as the first fruits of the, of the dead. He did rise and he will do it for all those who believe in him. So church, you have to decide today, will I agree with Job and say, I know that my redeemer lives that's the key part of the road to redemption. You must declare faith in Jesus Christ. Well, there's one more stop on the road I want to show you. We've seen the recognition of death, the fog of confusion, the declaration of faith, and lastly, we see number four, the joy of victory. The joy of victory. At the end of Job's story, after God shows up and sets Job and his friends straight, there's a moment where the man who had lost so much had been restored. 
Job 42.10 says, The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job 42.12, The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys, and he had seven sons and three daughters. And then again in Job 42, 16, after all this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations, and Job died an old man full of days. Now, I want to be clear with you. Sometimes when you turn to the Lord, he will bless you just like this, physically, materially, everything. But Job was a unique test case of someone in great suffering. Many times, dare I say, often, the blessings of God fall on us like this when we trust in him after we die and are raised. That doesn't make them any less real, but it does mean that we have to trust him by faith. That Christ is coming, that he will raise us up and then pour out all the eternal blessings in the heavenly places upon us. Most people, whether they admit it or not, will tell you that they think about what happens when they die. I want to show you 1 Corinthians 15, 50, a picture of what happens. And we'll close with this text. A picture of what happens if you live your life for Jesus and declare your faith in him. I can show you what victory looks like after you die. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, Paul looks forward, speaking of when Christ comes back to raise his people. He says, I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable in inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the imperishable body must put on the imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus, there is victory. Even if your life requires the faith of a mustard seed in the face of extreme suffering, you need to know there is vindication, there is redemption because our Redeemer lives. One day, one glorious day, Jesus is coming back and he will give the gift of resurrection to everyone who trusted in him by faith. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave will also raise your bodies, whether dead or alive, when the trumpet sounds and the sting of death will be gone forever. Christ defeated it 2,000 years ago and gave the promise to us by faith. And when he returns, it'll be done for good. And the way he raised himself, he will raise us. That's your redemption. So, friend, can I ask you, have you been redeemed? Do you need a redemption today? What does it look like? First, there must be a recognition that apart from Jesus, there is only death. Sin has made a separation between you and God. And if you keep going the way you're going without repentance, without turning your heart, mind, and life over to God, it will only lead to more death, more of the same. The corpse will continue to be a corpse. You have to understand that there may be confusion. There will be pain. There will be suffering. You may even incur a great cost to follow Jesus. But at some point, despite all of these things, at some point you have to declare your faith in Jesus. You have to say either the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive or he's not. Either Jesus is alive or he's dead. And if the tomb is empty, if he's alive, everything is true. Messiah, Savior, Lord, grace, forgiveness, Son of God, steadfast love, heaven, raised to life. It's all true. If you will declare in faith today, my Redeemer lives, then when Jesus comes back, he will raise and redeem you. 
The joy of victory that Christ experienced on that Sunday morning at Joseph's tomb will be your victory when he raises and calls you to himself. So listen, the road to redemption, if you hear nothing else, hear this. The road to redemption leads to Jesus and it flows through Jesus. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. So the tomb is empty today. What will you say? As for me, I know my Redeemer lives. Let's pray.